Well, we've been involved in Nicaragua since 1986, and my wife went down there initially for uh, as a consultant for the Nicaraguan Ministry of Education. They had uh, set up a school in Managua and brought in uh, several hundred, I believe, deaf kids. It was a uh, an oralist school, but a sign language emerged. Uh, was considered somewhat of a linguistic phenomenon at the time. Uh, it's 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 a um, an event that's studied in colleges, uh, really all over the world at this point. <clears throat> For the first several years, the uh, our organization, which is Nicaraguan Sign Language Projects, was uh, pursuing research into the emergence of the language itself. So it was a primarily a, or really an entirely scientific venture. Uh, in 1994, late 94, that shifted dramatically uh, into an intervention project, which at the time was centered in Bluefields, Nicaragua, which is on the Atlantic side of the country. <laughs> intervention meaning that we shifted from documenting the emergence of the language, from studying the grammar of the language to uh, fostering the nationalization of the language. That is to say, the language had become vibrant and a vibrant deaf community had, had emerged in Managua, the capital city on the west coast. <clears throat> Our goal was to take that language and give it to uh, deaf people and particularly children in other parts of the country so that these kids would not grow up uh, languageless, in effect. We're not the only organization, obviously, that does that. The uh, Nicaraguan Deaf Association that emerged in the late 80s is involved in that. I believe there are, another, there are a number of other organizations that take part in that. I'm not going to really go into all of that now. <clears throat> My focus is going to be on our proposal or concept that uh, not only the language needs to be spread, but deaf children need to know about their language. And as I go from slide to slide, I'll push out what I mean by that. I should warn you that uh, we have a bunny rabbit in my house that apparently has eaten through the cable <laughs> for, the, uh, for this computer. I am now down to 77%. I'm hoping this lasts the full hour. I'll certainly, when it gets very low, give you all a warning. Okay. So, Good. And so do you want Steve to show a slide? Slide number two. Okay, we need to see slide number two and Adam needs to show it. There we go. Uh, I'm looking at slide number one there. Okay, I'm seeing slide number two. It's called our sign languages, even languages. That there we go. At? That's what we're looking at, yes. Okay, it's see? not what I'm seeing on the bottom of the screen, but maybe... It doesn't Maybe matter. it's okay. Are, are we seeing what? It, what scribe? What? All right. I need to see a slide too. There we go. It says, "Are signed languages even languages?" Is that what we're supposed to see? That's right. And yes. I know with this audience, I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, <laughs> I also know that a lot of um, a lot of the talks prior to now have been on very technical aspects of. Uh, of sign writing itself. Uh, I am, notwithstanding my occupation, somewhat of a Luddite when it comes to computers and high-tech things. I, I did get a smartphone last week. So I'm just <laughs> looking at the times I wanted to smash it. <laughs> I understand, James. I feel the same way. <laughs> so when I ask the question, are sign languages even languages? All right? I'm talking about the experiences that I've had in Nicaragua over this issue, but I'd be willing to bet that any one of you who are working as educators run into this all the time. Okay? I would tell you, because I'm with linguists all the time, I work with linguists, I don't consider myself one of them, <laughs> that obviously linguists will tell us that sign languages obviously are languages. You know? And linguists will say it, but in my experience, most people don't actually believe it. And in fact, teachers in general don't really believe it. 
And truth be told, my experience that teachers in deaf schools, well, they know the linguists say it is, so they give the company line. And they say, of course, it's a language, okay? But they don't really believe it either. At least they're not fully convinced. And I hear a lot, it's a language, but it's an inferior language. All right? And when asked to define that, they say, well, the vocabulary is very limited. Of course, there's no real grammatical structure. It's not a particularly sophisticated or complex system. I hear it a lot. Okay? And I got to assume, I don't hear it from everybody, to be fair, but I do hear it. And I got to assume that if that's the way teachers of the deaf are feeling, then there are a lot of uh, deaf people themselves who only half believe that their language is, in fact, a complex, sophisticated language. Okay, so I go to the next slide. I think we have an international audience here, but in the United States we have an expression that when you're from Missouri, we, Missouri is called the show me state. Okay? If you can't show me why sign languages are at a par with speech-driven languages, well, you know, if you can't teach it, you don't know it. <laughs> Which brings us to an interesting point from my perspective. Hearing school children are taught metalinguistic skills in elementary school. Fourth grade, fifth grade, a lot in the sixth grade. Deaf children, interpreters, teachers of the deaf, on the other hand, are almost never taught metalinguistic skills. Okay, go to the next slide, and I will tell you that it's only within the past year or so I've even heard the term metalinguistic skills. <laughs> I, have, I had no idea what that meant, but I do have a definition for it, which is it's a highfalutin or fancy way of saying someone is aware of how language is constructed. Okay. Is it being able to discuss grammatical rules using labels? That is my simple definition of it. My wife's is a linguist as well, you know, it's, that's not really the actual definition, but close <laughs> enough. Okay. All that means was when I was in grade school, we had to learn what nouns were what verbs, adjectives, adverbs. We did something called diagramming sentences. We learned participles and relative clauses and infinitives and prepositions and conjunctions and on and on and on. Now, you don't have to know those terms to speak English or Spanish or, or Dutch or whatever. Five-year-olds don't know those terms and they're quite fluent. Okay? You can go your whole life without knowing those terms. But part of the fourth and fifth grade experience is to learn, learn those terms so you can swear you'll never ever have to do that again. That's something that hearing kids go through, okay? Yes. Deaf kids do not. Yeah. Oh, they're introduced to that concept when they're learning the dominant speech-driven language, but they don't learn it about sign language in general. Can we go to the next slide? My ivory tower. <laughs> sign language linguists, I'm married to one discuss grammar labels that apply to sign languages. They talk about classifiers and clinics and spatial verbs and locative objects. But I got to tell you, outside of them, nobody or very few people have any knowledge of what these terms mean. They don't use these labels. Teachers of the deaf don't use these labels. In my experience, interpreters, sign language interpreters, don't know these labels. And there's, I think there's a shift now, and you can all Claim I'm wrong, but my experience in any event is they don't know these. Certainly in Nicaragua, they don't know what these terms are. And I would then ask, well, if you want deaf children to be treated like hearing children, and I think that's a given that they ought to be, and hearing children are made to feel miserable over these terms in their language, why can't deaf kids be made miserable too? <laughs> okay, let's go to the next call. <laughs> and then, of course, I've actually heard sign language is not a language, not in the true sense, because real languages, you know, can be written, right? Okay, I'm talking to the sign writing crowd, so we all know 
that uh, sign languages can be written. So I'm not going to go into that at all. Right? I am going to talk a little bit about how we think we can integrate sign writing and of course to teach school children about grammar of their signed language. So let's go to the next slide. I'm down to 69%, so that's not bad on my power here. <laughs> Good. This is something I talk about a lot okay, in Nicaragua, which is that it's all about respect. And to put it another way, it's about self-respect. Okay? You cannot demand equality in a system if you personally don't feel you're entitled to it. Okay? And in the end, the people who will advocate for the rights of deaf people are deaf people, because if they don't do it, nobody else will. And they're not going to do it until they have sufficient self-esteem or self-respect to believe that they're entitled to it. Okay? So one of the reasons in Nicaragua we were advocating in the programs we had, whether they were language clinics, and sometimes we actually got involved in running schools was that the teachers would always be deaf, or they'd be a hearing teacher teamed up with a deaf teacher. The concept being that children, deaf children, would, or hearing children too, would see deaf adults in positions of authority. Okay? Again, that's about respect. One of the reasons we focused a lot on sign writing is that sign languages can be written, it's demonstrated our respect for the language. Okay? Anyway, a deaf child who ultimately comes, becomes a deaf adult has got to be convinced the sign languages are bona fide members of the human language club. Right? Self-respect is empowering. Empowered individuals demand respect from others. Anybody who's involved in uh, any minority group in any society that's trying to get respect knows what I'm talking about. Let me go a little bit into our research methodology, which is that we spent years videotaping deaf Nicaraguans with first language fluency. I said on the slide it says ISN fluency. ISN stands for Nicaraguan Sign Language, or in Spanish, idioma de señas de Nicaragua. Okay? The, um, we would present drawings, we present cartoons, Without any language, without any speech involved, in order to elicit sentences and narratives. Sometimes we just ask people to describe personal experiences, or I, we they show us a sign. I go, well, use it in a sentence. We would film these. We would transcribe them using sign writing. Not all of it, to be sure. And now we have to go back and digitize all these things because technology has caught up with us. Okay. <clears throat> we would go to the next slide. We would analyze recordings and transcriptions. We're looking for grammatical patterns. Okay? We would compare input from multiple sources to confirm consistent patterns. What I mean by that is <clears throat> if we see a particular form of grammar that we can identify, we've got to see it in a whole lot of people before we say, well, this is actually a part of Nicaraguan Sign Language. Okay? I do want to give special thanks, and you're going to see pictures of her as we go along, to uh, Saida, Saida Perales Rocha, who's from Managua. She is, she, um, I don't know if she was born deaf, but she's certainly prelingually deaf, so Nicaraguan Sign Language is her, uh, um, her first language and her native language. She's now a teacher, by the way. But she came up, we brought her up from Nicaragua to uh, Maine, and we worked um, for, for two uh, seasons with her, many months. She was one of our primary inf informants, but not the only one. And again, we did not want to produce a, a textbook about the uh, grammar of CIDA. We wanted to produce the textbook about the grammar of Nicaraguan Sign Language. So anything that went in there, it might be CIDA as the inf primary informant, but it's all backed up. The other reason we like CIDA is that until we brought her to the U.S., she didn't have any ASL at all. There's always some concern as how much is the Nicaraguan Sign Language, how much is it contaminated um, 
by American Sign Language? And the answer is languages borrow. It's what they do. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Again, it's not what this presentation is about. Um, but CIDA, any ASL CIDA had was ASL that had been borrowed by Nicaraguan Sign Language. So that's why she was useful. All right, next slide. I also want to thank Yuri Shepard Kegel. That's my daughter, but she is also born in Bluefields. We adopted her when she was 15. She's the narrator in our story of the three little pigs. It was a six-minute presentation she just gave, and uh, then I went and transcribed it into sign writing. And this lecture is going to be pulling grammar primarily from that source. Right? Obviously, Nicaraguan Sign Language is her first language. On the other hand, she has lived in the United States for nine years now. Uh, she is bilingual in Nicaraguan and American Sign Language. Uh, in the textbook we produce, we do not use Yuri as an informant. We use her as an actress. That is to say, if I need a sign produced, and the one I took in Nicaragua is too blurry, <laughs> I have her redo it. We don't use her as a primary informant because the reality is she's got a code shift back and forth between American Sign Language and Nicaraguan Sign Language, and for scientific reasons, it just wouldn't be valid. Okay. Uh, we're going to go to in the next slide. I, I mentioned it before, ISN. I see it sometimes as NSLs Nicar for Nicaraguan Sign Language. <laughs> yeah. My apologies to the Dutch. Um, but we always use ISN. That's what the Deaf Association wants us to use, and so we will defer to them. Okay? I had mentioned about Nicaraguan Sign Language borrowing uh, ASL. We didn't see a lot of that in the beginning as the language was forming. One of the reasons is that uh, the Deaf people themselves took pride in the fact that, that a language is emerging. They did not want to contaminate it with other languages. But as they had more confidence in their language, they were more willing to uh, grab lexicon from other areas. And that was a phenomenon in the late 80s and early 90s. But the other thing that happened is a major geopolitical change as well. Uh, Nicaragua and the United States, you know, in the 80s, for those of you who can remember or not just studied it, or old enough to know, we're effectively at war. Uh, <clears throat> so you didn't have deaf people from the United States, or really much of anybody from the United States, just going down to Nicaragua just to, uh, to hang out. <laughs> but you do now. And because you have a vibrant deaf community there, that attracts deaf people from other countries, and that means there's contamination. On top of that, you have the explosion of technology. You know, interpreters on TV, interpreters on the internet, the kind of thing we're doing right now. All of that impacts it. But that's what languages do. That's how languages grow. They're dynamic or they die. Moving along, we're on the next uh, slide. Are all sign languages similar? And the answer is yes. And it has to be that way because deaf people are flesh and blood. And all human languages are more similar than they are dissimilar. And since deaf people, I believe, are human, then I have to say <laughs> their language is going to be very similar to the general human language family as well. Okay? That said, all sign languages are visually based. All sign languages are speech based. Okay? There are differences. Chiefly, signers are able to exploit the signing space and the various grammatical strategies, I'm just reading the slide here, to express special relationships in a way that speech-driven languages cannot. We're going to talk about that more as I go through this. Okay? But you don't see a lot of classifiers in English. You do see a lot of classifiers in sign languages. Okay? Are the, the classifier set in ASL is not the same as the classifier set in ISN, but there's still classifiers. A classifier is a classifier is a classifier, you know? Just like the word for, for run in Spanish is correr, whereas in English it's run, but they're both verbs. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. 
By the way, I should warn people, I do not sign American Sign Language. And therefore, when you see a word, when I see a sign in Nicaraguan that someone might recognize as borrowed, I won't recognize it. I have to, somebody else who knows ASL has to say, hey, that's an ASL term. I'm going, yeah, well, it was probably borrowed or it's, it's so transparent. It's probably just a coincidence. Anyway, I hear a lot the word iconicity. In fact, I went to a lecture, a uh, linguistic lecture, some months ago where everyone was talking about how iconic um, Nicaraguan Sign Language was or American Sign Language was, was okay? which is fine. I know a lot of people use that word. Judy and I cringe when we hear that sign language is iconic. Okay? And we would argue that Nicaraguan Sign Language is, is most definitely not iconic. And the example I give is you hold up a five fingers, and most of us figure, hmm, that's five objects there. That's probably the number five. Okay, but when you see a sign, I just give the sign here for tree. <laughs> that does not look like a tree to me. <laughs> um, that looks like a bunch of sign writing symbols to me, frankly. <laughs> well, that too. Okay. Now, I can understand how the sign resembles a tree, but that's not iconic. Let's go to the next slide. It highlights this. This is out of the three little pigs which is our primary source for this lecture. And you see Yuri there putting her hand on her face and doing things with her hand. And for those of you, which would be all of you, I guess, who can read the sign writing, um, that does not look like a wolf to me. That looks like sign writing. <laughs> but the shadow, I would argue that shadow does look kind of like a wolf. <laughs> That's what we mean by iconic. Ah, uh, I see. Ah, oh, yeah, here's the difference. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So we talk a lot about resemblance. Okay? Signs, in some way, they tend to look like a prominent feature or features associated with the concept they represent. Okay, sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's abstract. Right? So the wolf there, the long nose, the pointed ears, those are features of a wolf. Okay, so, so the sign in that sense resembles the wolf because we, you know, we think of those prominent features. Of course, I could use bushy tail, I could use sharp teeth, a lot of things I could use. Right? What difference does it really make whether we call, whether we use the term resemblance or use the term iconic? And the problem is that if Nicaraguan sign language or French sign language, whatever sign language you're using it was truly iconic, then what you'd say is the language is a sequence of pictures. And when, when non-signers hear that your language is nothing more than a series of pictures, there they go. Well, then that's not really a language. It's communication, to be sure, but it's not what we associate with a language. And, and that might be, make some sense, except that Nicaraguan sign language or any sign language you know, that I'm aware of, they're not a series of pictures. They're not iconic at all. So that's why we use the term, we avoid the term, and if I've done nothing else but convince you never to use that term again, my wife will be happy. <laughs> Let's go ahead. <laughs> this is initialization, <clears throat> which again, in the grammar of language, of sign language, is an important concept. Right? And certainly in, in Nicaragua, we see signs that are initialized. And the example I gave here is adult, which is like that. And again, I've heard that that's an ASL sign. <laughs> is it, Adam? It's a signed exact English sign oh. within ASL relation. So it is, but it isn't. It gets complex. <laughs> of course, the Spanish word for adult is also adult. It's adulto. So it, the initials are going to be the same if it's initialized. Huh? In any event, what I found interesting is that Yuri, in her six-minute rendition of the Three Little Pigs, the only initialized sign in the whole thing was adult. Hmm. So if you look at a list of vocabulary, you know, you're going to find a fair number of initialized words. But in practice, not that much. Let's go to the next slide. Right. 
in in Yuri's story, she talks about the mother pig with her three little pigs. Okay? And she used this sign from Mama, which is not an initialized sign. It is the sign from Mother in Nicaragua. Sida makes it with uh, an M here, mm. so she initializes it. So that's a shift that we've seen within Nicaragua. And I can go on and on about what that's all about. Um, but the bottom line is the, the upper crust death. Try to show <laughs> it. <laughs> and we'll visualize signs. Okay? Huh. And, uh, and others will initialize those signs as well when they're in the presence of the elite. And when I turn to them and say, do you actually initialize that? when you just talk to people on the street and they go, oh, God, no. So, huh. okay, I, I mentioned that because I'll bet others in other countries you're seeing the same sort of phenomenon. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> I don't know. I stole that off the of Google. I think the baby's cute. <laughs> yes, and I didn't take that picture, so whoever has the copyright, my sincere apologies. <laughs> Fine. The initialization, I would say, certainly is an advantage for Spanish speakers who are trying to memorize the signs, but those would be hearing people. One could make the argument that since you want deaf kids to learn the, the dominant speech-driven language, initialization might help them make the transfer too. I'm not so sure that's true. But in any event, what I am sure about is for children, with the exception of babies who can read, who can read Spanish, initializing Nicaraguan signs does not have anything to do with the way the child acquires language. Okay. That brings me to the next slide. <clears throat> is it gesturing or is it signing? Right? Good storytellers in spoken languages enhance their narratives with gestures. That is, I'll throw some emotion into it. Facial expression, a shrug of the shoulders, intonation. Okay. So good storytellers in sign languages use gestures for the same purposes. Although, of course, signs do have their origins in a lot of gestures. So what's the difference between gesturing or signing? We go to the next slide. And we think function. A sign is composed of many elements. Each one of those elements is meaningless by itself, but together it represents a concept. It's like words are composed of letters. Components of signs or, or, gra or grammar. Right? So you look at the signs, it's going to have a hand shape, hand shape orientation, hand motion, eye gazing, facial expression. Right? But you can supplement those with gestures. We'll go to the next slide, we'll take a, a slice out of the three little pig story, and I'll show you what I mean. And just so you know, I don't steal all pictures without uh, complying with copyright issues. I did get permission for this one. <laughs> That's fine. All right. So gestures make communications more vivid, okay? But they're not integral to the signs. Just like I can talk in a monotone and put you all to sleep, but it's still English. All right. So here we have the pig saunters, and. You can see how Yuri is doing it, but this is the sign for pig. <coughs> and this is sauntering. Actually, she goes like this. See the difference? Like, oh, yeah, you can see it, yeah. Right? You can read that. <laughs> and right. her, sh her shoulder is going up and down, too. <laughs> so let's go to the next slide and have a closer look at this. I got my handy microscope. Ah, yeah. <laughs> That's cute. <laughs> Anyhow, and all right, so let's go to the next one. We might you might want to flip back and forth. In fact, go back to go back to the microscope and I'll just read the next one. So go back one. There you go. Alright, so we look at our microscope here, we see a downward eye gaze. We see a person by legs classifier. Um that's a classifier hand shape. We see an ambling movement of the hand shape. These are all components of the sign for saunter. Okay? Moving your shoulders back and forth is not. That's a body movement. 
<laughs> that uh, Yuri's thrown in there that supplements her signing. It certainly makes it more vivid. That's what we mean by a gesture. Okay. Let's jump over to sign number to the slide number twenty-four, which has the little cartoon on it. There you go. So another challenge I get. It's all pantomime. <laughs> or is it signing? Pantomime, by definition, is an act without words, but with gestures and bodily movements only. Okay? So clearly sauntering, that was handshape, handshape orientation, and classifier, and eye gazing. Right? So that's not pantomime. There's a bona fide sign. But a lot of these signs that you might think are pantomiming, when we look at them under our microscope, <laughs> they're not. So here we have a circle sign, which is uh, the man moving the push cart. Right? This is man like like so. And you can see there he's moving it. Man is clearly a sign. Right? Question is, is this pantomime? What does that rate as a sign? So let's go to the next. <laughs> right? And we see looking at it close up, it's made with what we call a handling classifier. Okay? That's a technique that Yuri employs frequently when she needs to produce a sign on the spot. Couldn't tell you what the sign for card is. There may not actually be one in that sense, but she just uses a handling classifier to signify it, which means she's produced a sign. Let's go to the next slide. All right, we have an ISN grammar rule then. In a verb of motion or location, the eyes follow or gaze at the classifier serving as the theme. So I think you know what eyes following means. I guess you know what a verb of motion is. I'm not sure if you know what a verb of location is. I'm not going to ex explain that just now. <laughs> we've got a word, we've got a word uh, label classifier. Well, we ought to explain what that is. <laughs> and we've got another one called theme. See a lot of labels in this one little handling classifier she produced. So let's go to the next. <laughs> classifiers abound in Nicaraguan sign language. Classifiers abound in sign languages. There shouldn't be any interpreter out there or any teacher of the deaf who can't define what a classifier is. Although in my experience in Nicaragua, they're just beginning to understand these concepts. Our argument, of course, is that deaf children should be able to tell you, oh, well, let me explain to you what a classifier is. <laughs> but classifier, hand shapes incorporated into the verbs are used to show appearance, location, and or movement. After a signer indicates some particular thing, a classifier can be used to show where the thing is located, what it looks like, and where and how it moves. In the case of a physical object, the classifier may resemble its surface feature, depth, or general shape. I'm not going to give you a, a grammar lesson here, but very basically, <laughs> it's a flat hand shape, so it's a classifier for anything with a flat surface. Okay? Um, you know, that's a rounded rock type of classifier. <laughs> the, um, I think this is the classifier for a vehicle in American Sign Language, although I'm not sure. In, Ameri in Nicaragua, we see this. Hand shape for a vehicle. What okay. slide should we be on? Are we on the slide for classifiers? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But well, moving right along, and we're down to 43 <laughs> percent. Right. Okay, so Steve, if you go to the next slide, I guess is that right? Yeah. Okay. Right. Classifiers in the quote paraphrase uh, Governor Romney are people too. <laughs> Oh, dear. Classifiers can represent living things, especially people. You know, two-legged person walking along. Yeah. Yes. Oh. There are two rules when you use classifiers. One, it relates back to an already specified person or thing, kind of like a pronoun does. You can't have a pronoun if it doesn't relate back to a noun. Right? And the second is the classifier becomes part of a verb that shows where and how the person or thing moves. So that's a, a basic definition, but we're going to see that close up. So let's go to the next one. We're back to this. So we have a handling classifier relates back 
to the identified person. Right? So, what was the antecedent? It was the man. It was the noun. So when you see the handling classifier like this, whose hands? Well, it's the man's hands. How do I know that? Because I already told you. So that's the basic rule of the classifier, is that there's got to be an antecedent noun, usually in the same sentence, but not necessarily. <laughs> um, another example, when I said this is a, a vehicle, well, what is it? Is it a taxi? Is it a bicycle? Is it a horse? Is it a train? Well, I've already told you that earlier in the sentence, or maybe in the sentence before. But if I just went like this, that's meaningless, and our mind, my mind won't process it, nor will the deaf viewer. You've got to tell them beforehand. This is not rocket science, because if it were, <laughs> I would do it. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, this is also from the three little pigs, as in almost all my examples. The old man carries a heavy bale of straw on his back. The signs in red are handling classifiers. Okay, this is him holding it tight. They're, they're just freezing it, pointing to the back. There's the straw, and that's how he's handling it. Huh? How do we know whose hands it is? Because before all of that, I said the man. I said the old man, who Yuri did. So I would point out the dictionaries that I have seen of Nicaraguan Sign Language have roughly about a thousand or so signs in them. The Nicaraguan Deaf Association has one with, I think, 1,300 signs. Uh, the one we produced last year is 875, but the, the new one will have about 1,100. Um, but it doesn't mean anything, you know. There are lots more signs that, that could go into... Uh, the dictionary, but when you consider that it's a productive language, okay, well, then the number of potential signs is just infinite. So when someone asks how many signs are there, and they go, well, there are only a thousand signs according to the little dictionary I got. So <laughs> if I bought an English dictionary that had 200 words in it, you wouldn't think English had 200 words. Exactly. Exactly. It's also not <clears throat> as productive as sign languages are. So, because it's a, it's a productive language, you can't exactly produce a dictionary with this, but you're going to hit 30, 40,000 words immediately, or however many signs you need. Okay, move on to the next slide. And we have a um, speech driven versus sign languages. Right there's side of there taking advantage of three-dimensional space. Speech-driven languages can't do that. Sign languages can. Let's go to the next. Okay. So I have object of a preposition versus a locative object. I certainly know what an object of a preposition was because I went to the fourth grade. I haven't had a clue what a locative object was. I never heard of it. Okay. In Nicaraguan sign language, you have Action and spatial relationships, that is from, to, on, at, so forth, they're all merged within a spatial verb. So, the grammatical term object of the preposition is not applicable, because we tend not to use prepositions. I'm not going to say they don't have prepositions in the language, because they do. But by and large, when we talk about spatial relationships, the cup is on the table. The man puts the cup on the table. Okay? We use a preposition. And an object of, of the preposition in English. You don't have preposition in Nicaraguan Sign Language, therefore you don't have an object of the preposition. This is why hearing people get so confused trying to master the sign language. This is why deaf people get so confused trying to figure out what all these prepositions and prepositional objects are. Okay? All right. The object of a, the, there's still an object in that sentence, though. It's not a direct object. That's an English term or a Spanish term. We call it a, lo a locative object. That is, it's used to describe a sign that specifies a location. Let's go to the next. So what is the next? Next slide, Steve. Yeah. There we go. Spatial I gotta, verbs. i got to find online. Here we go. Okay. Spatial verbs that show direction of movement are called 
directional verbs. Again, a new label to learn. Directional verbs show source location, another label, okay, to depart. Depart from Boston, so that was the source. <laughs> goal location, to touch. I, I, I touch the book, so my goal of touching is the book. Or maybe I take the cup from the refrigerator and put it on the table, so I got a source location and a goal location. Okay? But the verb is called a spatial verb because it's defining a spatial relationship. Right? I've also heard it called an applicative verb. It's bad enough to have to learn one new label. Now you got a, another label that tells me the same thing. And therefore, the object within the applicative verb is called an applied object. And how do you bake an applied object? With a classifier clinic. Now there's a mouthful. And <laughs> Nothing else. You can impress your friends with, with talking about classifier clinics. <laughs> so, what did I just do? I go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. okay. We have it. Go ahead. Um, we're analyzing the three little pigs here to learn labels in the grammar. <laughs> Within the spatial verb, we have a grounded object which has to precede the moving figure. I bold-faced those things because those are new labels. I don't even know what they mean yet, but <laughs> there's a the rule. Right? Uh, the word order within the verb is object, subject, verb. You know, learn in English and Spanish too, we're seeing or thinking subject, verb, object all the time. You learn Latin, <laughs> see the verb at the end. Right? In Nicaraguan Sign Language, in any event, when we're doing spatial relationships, we normally see the verb at the end. And the sentence structure tends to be object, verb, excuse me, object, subject, verb, or more accurately, an object, a subject, and a spatial verb. And within the spatial verb, we always see a word order that's object, subject, verb. Okay? We will sometimes see the sentence come out as subject, object, spatial verb versus object, subject, spatial verb. Um, but within the spatial verb itself, the word order is always consistent. Okay? When signing a spatial verb with a source location or a goal location or both, your eyes follows the moving figure. It has to. The eye, this eye gazing we call smooth pursuit. When we took, um, when we were filming Sida and eliciting sentences from her, she told us that I gaze had nothing to do with the grammar, that she didn't practice it herself. So we then played back the last <laughs> 10 sentences we had elicited. And she uses eye gazing every single time. Of course. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the next. Directional spatial verbs. So we have all sorts of fun labels. Grounded object a moving figure, a source location, a goal location, a classifier clinic, and smooth pursuit. These are all labels that I just brought up. Okay. I should go into detail with them, but I only got 16 minutes left and 32% power. <laughs> I'm, I'm just making a point here that one ought to know the labels of uh -huh. one's language. Because I, think, I think you have more self-respect for your language when you realize, oh my god, this is complicated. And your teachers, who by now, you're hearing people are now walking out of the room going, we did not sign up to learn all this stuff. <laughs> it's okay. That's the point. <laughs> by the way, she's signing there, uh, the butterfly lands on the flower. And I'm looking at the word order here, and I see the, butter the flower comes first. There's your object, and there's your butterfly comes next, and then lands on the flowers last. In our programs, we have always written sign language left to right as opposed to from top down. Okay? Um, there are logistics reasons for that and the nature of the old-fashioned computer programming I was using. Uh, <coughs> yeah, James, to, James, James was using SignWriter DOS, just so you all know, because James and I worked together way back in 1996 and earlier. So. That's, that's the reason. Go ahead, James. <laughs> yeah, James being James essentially still does. Um, <laughs> okay. But also, quite frankly, we took a vote in the class, and this is what they wanted to do. I go, fine, whatever. <laughs> um, but So this is written left to right for us. Let's go to the next slide. 
when we talk about clinics. We never talk about clinics in English. Again, this is something I never heard about, heard of before. Our minds see two different signs separated by a very weak boundary. That's a Judy explanation. That's my wife. <laughs> okay. The grounded object classifier, I know what that is, is a clinic. So what's the classifier clinic? It simply means that while the classifier carries its own meaning, it cannot function as a separate sign. Instead, the classifier must be linked with the verb. Okay? And the way we are signed for a classifier clinic, which is illustrative, is you got a hand you got your hand shapes, you got one here, you got another hand shape there, and you bring this one over. That's the clinic. This is the clinic. All right, let's go to the next slide. Wow, I'm down to 29%. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> I know. We're gonna make this. Okay, yes. so I'm just right. So going back to the three little pigs, because again, that's our source for all the grammar of this lecture. The wolf looks up, has an idea, climbs the house, climbs onto the roof. <laughs> Talk full of grammar. Okay. But I'll give you a chance to read all that, because you can read these signs, I guess. But we're going to focus here on the next slide because we're going to just talk right now about the spatial verb. Right? The word order within this whole sentence is subject, object, verb. Right? Usually I see object, subject, verb. I've said that before. The exception being that when a subject is topicalized. And since we're really talking about the wolf, the wolf comes first. So in this sentence structure, even though it's a showing a spatial relationship, um, the subject is preceding the object. It is, in fact, a compound sentence. All right, so it begins with what we call a plain verb construction. Uh, in English, that would be the subject verb object, John hit Mary, or Mary hit John. Uh, <laughs> politically correct. <laughs> Mary hit John back. Over. Okay. Uh, we see the wolf first. Sign for wolf, and I saw um, him climbing up the house. But we're going to focus on his jumping on the roof, which really talks. There, there's a spatial relationship, okay? And that's a spatial verb construction. So let's go to the next slide and have a good look at this. That's just the spatial verb. The classifier clinic is in red. Mm -hmm. It is a flat surface classifier. What is the flat surface? It's the roof. How do we know that's the roof? Because we had preceded it with the sign for house. Okay. Uh, let's see. All right. Now, the roof doesn't move. It is anchored or grounded. It is fixed. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's the grounded object within the spatial verb. <clears throat> We're going to show a spatial relationship vis-a-vis -vis this roof. Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> and now we have some more components of the directional spatial verb. To wit, the moving figure, also known as the theme. We see in green <clears throat> a person by arms classifier or a person by legs classifier. <laughs> with his legs, but he jumps on all four, so it's all. Whatever. <laughs> anyway, it's the moving figure classifier. It relates back to a noun. What noun? Well, a living creature. If it's the person by arms and legs classifier, that would be the wolf, which was the very first sign in our sentence. Okay? This classifier is the subject within the spatial verb. Okay? And the subject within the spatial verb is the theme. What it is. Well, who, who's doing it? The wolf's doing it. All right, let's go to the next. Another component of the spatial verb is the movement from the source or to the goal location, or both. The movement here is in blue, as are the contact symbols. <clears throat> contact <laughs> in English is done with a preposition. He, he climbs on the roof. He stands on the roof. But in Nicaraguan sign language, that prepositional concept on 
is merged with the verb um, <clears throat> jumps. When we say the cup is on the table, is on is in fact the verb. It's not is, it's not on, it's is on. <clears throat> All right. And of course, as the sign writing shows, they're staring here because you got to be staring at the uh, the move the uh, classifier on legs to see what he's doing. Is he watch it go? So you watch the wolf go from a source location out there. So there really is no source location, just elsewhere, but to a goal location. The goal location being touching the roof. So you've got three components here. <clears throat> you've got a classifier that's serving as uh, <clears throat> as the theme. You've got a grounded object, which is uh, produced with a classifier clinic. So that's two classifiers in the same verb. And you have the movement and contact itself, which is actually the verb form, the verb component of the spatial verb. Isn't that cute? Yeah, it is. Absolutely. <laughs> OK, so we go to the next slide. I'm going to allow a little bit of a question and answering before we run out of time and or power. Yes, we have about five minutes left or so. Mm -hmm. That's right. So I just point out that we barely scratched the surface in this one little lecture, and I list a whole bunch of terms, but if I, I can easily list about 30 terms, labels that, that people ought to know about. So just a real quick list here. Serial verbs, by the way, are real common in Nicaraguan Sign Language, not so much in other sign languages. Anyway, let's go to the next slide. Can the grammar of a sign language be taught in a workshop? I've tried. <laughs> and you failed? Is that what you just said? Uh huh. Cannot do it. <laughs> That's too much. Uh huh. Right? Yes. You can only handle so much. You know, you, you go for about an hour, maybe two hours, and people are nodding off. <laughs> Series of <laughs> yes. But but on the other hand, it's this. The presentation is remarkable because it's documenting the grammar aspects, and I think it's a brilliant presentation because most people don't know this, James. So go and ahead. Yes. And we've always scratched the surface with terms that we really should go back and talk about and flesh out in detail, which I can't. Of course. Do no, we can't. And we, I want a few minutes to tell you about some comments I have. Oh, I'm almost done here. <laughs> okay. okay. It's outstanding. <laughs> That's why I say you need a series of workshops, which is another way of saying you need a whole course. Uh -huh. Next slide, why do we do it? Same reason I said in the very beginning, respect. You teach grammar to teach respect for the signer. You learn to write the sign language because that teaches respect for the signer. And, of course, the ultimate goal with children is to empower them. You begin with self-respect. And then we go to my last slide. Because yes. I know you're all saying is, okay, so you're producing sign language grammar books. Where can I get a hold of a sign language grammar book <laughs> sign language or French sign language or Turkish sign language that can be used <clears throat> not at the college or graduate school level, but that children and teachers will understand. And that picture, you know, as well, you know, having come up with this notion, I guess I have to go out and do it. <laughs> but that, that's what we've been working on. It's really an arduous process. Um, yes, yes. But we're making headway. It is brilliant. Um, now, is this the end of your slides? My last slide. And okay. I, I might want to. I'm sure you all agree. This is a remarkable presentation. I I want to thank you because um, I suspect you may have worked a little bit with Dr. Judy Shepherd Cagle, your wife. You mentioned her many times. And I want to thank you for all these terms because, you know, a lot of people may not realize that classifiers didn't just come out of the sky. I remember back in 1976 when I first met you and Judy, James, that, uh, that Judy was working on research on classifiers. Isn't that correct? She was, and her thesis was on locatives, I think. Uh-huh. I remember she was one of the pioneering... Um, researchers and linguists who worked with these new subjects. At the time, it was a very, very new idea that sign languages might have grammar. Yes, so. but to paraphrase Dr. Strangelove, what good is it if you don't tell the world? So, 
What good is it if you don't tell the world is what you just said. Um, right. it, by the way, I'm hoping to have uh, these uh, presentations interpreted. And I will have interpreters side by side. I'll get another video where they listen to you. And, and then we'd have the ASL next to you, and maybe we could do a Nicaraguan Sign Language version of your presentation today as well, if we can. And I want everyone to know that on your webpage, your presentation webpage 50, in the uh, Sign Writing Symposium presentation pages, we have two videos of Barney. Um, and he's showing, um, I guess he's signing in Nicaraguan Sign Language, isn't he? He's a deaf person. And he's teaching some some grammar points to people. Isn't that correct? I think no, Steve. Not. He's just introducing some of these concepts. It's excellent. And so we can't show it today because there's not enough time. But people who have witnessed this can go to the web page and view those videos, James. And I want you to know that Stefan Vorman is one of your biggest fans. He just wrote and wanted you to know that uh, he wanted to send his greetings. And he said, James has been of great influence in my personal history to develop decent sign writing skills and in the past we have had some kind of exchange on the sign writing list forum and he just he, he's been following your work since 1999 so I thought you should know that and they're working in you know in Germany they have now with Stefan Vormann's influence um, they have software where you can just uh, type from left to right with sign writing so if you ever want to try Deleg software for Nicaraguan sign language, you might. It's more modern than sign writer DOS. <laughs> well, I guess everybody can see how we integrate sign writing into all this. You really. Oh, can't. you do. Beautiful, beautiful. And Adam, what do you think? You're a teacher of sign language linguistics and um, American sign language. Isn't this an excellent presentation? Yeah, it's really, really, really good. It, and you're exactly right. A lot of people do not know this, and and as Valerie mentioned, I do teach American Sign Language Linguistics at a community college, and they just added that as a requirement for the interpreting program. That's so. great. Congratulations, Adam. I didn't know that, and I, believe me, Adam's the only one who could teach the course. <laughs> um, so I, I think that this presentation gives people an idea of how grammars and sign languages in general function, not just for, for Nicaraguan sign language. Isn't that right, James? Well, that's the point. Yes. Language is the language. They're all, you know, this is how all sign languages work. I see. Well, I think this is a meaningful presentation that we will refer to for years to come. Thank you very much. You know, James is presenting from a hotel. He's actually an airline pilot as well as a teacher. And uh, as is written, I think James has written over 40, maybe 50 books in sign writing where um, has written Nicaraguan sign language and all kinds of stories for deaf children have been translated and written in Nicaraguan sign language. Isn't that correct? Uh, little pigs being one of them. That's right. And by the way, Ingvild Roald from Norway just said, really, really enjoyable presentation. Thank you, James. Thank you. <laughs>